a good long drink here and I'll be ready to go. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, I don't know what's going on, but I've been warned there's a trap door. <laughs> Sam said he was going to wear earmuffs while I was preaching. I don't know. He didn't do that. Okay, thank you. So I don't know what all these things mean. Welcome back, Brother Kastner, I guess. Amen. <laughs> we love you. That's how we show love. The interesting thing is, as you have been studying the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, the Lord led us to teach not the whole book last year, but we went through and just looked at the word minister or ministry and developed some messages around those passages. That was uh, last year sometime. We went through several passages of First and Second Corinthians, actually, on the word minister and ministry and that was uh, a blessing to the brethren there, a blessing to me. And so uh, also during this, this year, we are studying, our memory verses are about the Holy Spirit. We're le we, every verse throughout our, this year on Wednesday nights and Sundays, we are memorizing verses about the Holy Spirit. And of course, you go, come into 1 Corinthians there's a, there are a lot of verses about the Holy Spirit. So we have been actually studying part of uh, chapter 2, chapter 3. And uh, so a lot of what I'm going to say tonight has been on my heart through the studies that I've been doing through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and also the memory verses that we're doing in Africa. So let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. It says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That is the title tonight, let us be found faithful. Let me read a couple more verses before we have a word of prayer and get into the message. Proverbs 26, verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Luke 18, 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. What will he find? Matthew 24, 46, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And then what Jesus said to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege it is to stand here in this pulpit again. We thank you for the faithful members of Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. We thank you for our pastor who is away. And we thank you, Lord, that your hand is upon him and each of our missionaries there in Thailand. We thank you, Lord, for watching over them, providing for them. And we do pray for their safe return, that we can fellowship with them again. Father, we thank you for the opportunities you've given us to hear the Word of God, even today, and the blessings that we've had in Sunday school hour, learning about faith and cha being challenged in the area of faith and trusting you. And uh, for the morning service, Father, about being uh, submitted to one to another and submitted unto you. So we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we've already received. But Father, we've come tonight to hear from you. We come. 
Lord, looking for your hand upon this message, looking for your power in this message, Father, and may I not be the one speaking, but may it be your Holy Spirit. Father, open the hearts, open the minds, open the understanding. Give me the words of wisdom, your words, that it may speak to each and everyone's heart here tonight. That only, we know that's the only thing you can do, Lord. Man cannot do that. But through your Spirit, you have something prepared for each and every one here tonight. We thank you right now, Lord, for what you're going to do. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was a stormy night in Birmingham, England. And the famous missionary Hudson Taylor was to speak at a meeting at the 7th Street Schoolhouse. His hostess assured him that nobody would attend on such a stormy night. But Taylor insisted on going. I must go, even if there was no one but the doorkeeper. As it turned out, about a dozen people showed up, but the meeting was marked with unusual spiritual power. Half of those present either became missionaries or gave their children to be missionaries, and the rest were faithful supporters of the China Inland Mission for years to come. You see, Hudson Taylor was committed to serving the Savior regardless of names who showed up or numbers, how many showed up, or the nature of the situation, stormy conditions. And God greatly honored his faithfulness. Greatly honored his faithfulness. Amen? Let's look at our verses tonight. What was, as you know, one of the serious problems of the Corinthian church concerned their former preachers or former missionaries or ministers of the church. And the congregation was esteeming one above the other. And it was causing divisions within the church. They, were, they began judging, as you know, judging the Apostle Paul. But they began judging their gifts, their ministry, the effectiveness of their ministry. And so some of them were behind Apollos. He was an eloquent preacher. Some of them got behind Cephas. Obviously, they were helped by either of these men. And still others were behind the Apostle Paul. But it became a critical matter because they began judging, began uh, becoming very critical of the preachers. And they were not just judging, you know, nicely. I mean, they were raking Paul over the coals. And uh, groups were forming within the church. Divisions were taking place. Deep feelings settled in. And the fellowship of the church, imagine the unity of the church, it was threatened. So Paul, in that Backdrop, he is telling the, the members of that church what to think about him, what to think about the servants of God. But I think the blessing about this passage of Scripture is that Paul thought this way about himself. And I think that's the challenge for preachers. You know, I'm, I'm, I may be preaching to preachers tonight, but I think everyone needs to hear sermons like this as well. Because a lot of this applies to me directly, but it applies to other ministers. And, in, and you will find in this message that you, to a certain degree, all these pa this passage of Scripture applies to your life. So he's telling us, let a man so account of us. Amen. So he's talking to, to each and every one of us. How are we to think? How are we to suppose ministers to be or consider them? 
So he says, think of us this way, as the ministers of Christ. Now, that word minister is very interesting. It literally means under rowers. And it refers to the slaves in the Roman galley ships. And these slaves, what were they doing? They were in the belly of that ship, chained. They were slaves chained in the belly of that ship. And their only job was to pull that oar, to row as hard as they could to pull that ship through the, through the sea. You see, Paul considered himself a galley slave. So really, we are called to be faithful slaves. Now, I know we don't like that term. But let me tell you, there's only one captain of the ship, Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. We are all galley slaves. Now, let me ask you, is one slave better than another slave? So how do we consider each other? How do we account of the men of God? You see, we're not the captains. We're only slaves. And we're all under orders. Amen? We are chained. We're bound. Amen? Amen. We are bound to Jesus Christ. They were allowed to do nothing but serve the master of the ship. And I think as if we consider what God has called us to do, as ministers, we are bound to Christ. And the only thing that we are to be doing, the only thing we exist for is to row for the master. That's why we're here. So no matter how much the minister means to your life, he is only an under rower. And that's not to put down ministers, amen, but an under rower, a slave of the master of the ship. And really, he's only one of many other under rowers, amen? So believers are not to judge or elevate ministers one above another. I, you know, we don't travel, we're not here in America, but a lot of these conferences and things that take place in America are, it's just this, elevating one minister above another minister. We are called to be faithful servants, faithful ministers, faithful slaves of the master. But I think secondly, if you look at verse or verse number one, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Not only are we called to be faithful servants, we're called to be faithful stewards. Now a steward also is often they were in the Bible and Bible times, a slave or a servant. And a steward, again, is a person who does not own anything. He just manages that which belongs to the master. He's not the owner. He's just the manager. And so he, yes, he may have had some authority other over other slaves or other servants of the household, but he had no control of or no authority over the master's things as far as owning them. And so he himself was still a servant of the master. We see this in Joseph's life. 
The Bible tells us in Genesis 39, 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had, he put into his hand. So Joseph was a manager, an overseer of everything that belonged to Potiphar. It didn't belong to Joseph. He just managed it for him. And so the Bible tells us here that we are not only ministers or servants, and we are called to be faithful servants, but we are also stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, that word mystery is not defined as we use it today. Like a mystery today in our mind would be something that we can't understand or that it's difficult to understand. But a mystery in the Bible is a revealed secret. It's already revealed. It refers to a secret openly revealed by God. It is a truth hidden in past ages, but now revealed to the people of God through the apostles. So when we say that we are stewards of the mysteries of God, we could say clearly today, we are stewards of the word of God. Amen. And being faithful stewards of the word of God, we must preach the whole counsel of God's word. We are not to mix this message with any other message. We're to be faithful stewards, faithful stewards of God's truth, of God's word. Now, the Bible tells us there's a requirement here in verse number two. When you think of a requirement, let it be known that it's demanded. It's a demand. It's not some option. It's something that God is demanding of us. God is demanding of every minister, of every steward, that a man be found faithful. Now, think of Joseph. When everything was put in his hand, it wasn't like the master was there every moment telling him what to do. He was trusted. And so stewards need to be faithful. They need to be reliable. They need to be trustworthy because the master isn't always there to tell him what to do or how to do it. Or, or, and so this is what Paul's getting at here. We are to be found faithful, trustworthy, and responsible. So when you put this in the context of 1 Corinthians, the main issue is not, is Paul popular? Is, Paul, is Apollos a better preacher than Paul? The main issue is, have Paul and Apollos been faithful? Been faithful. Have they, been a faithful, faith, have they been faithful to the work that God assigned them to do? Let us not forget, brethren, that the preacher or the minister is not called to be eloquent, not called to be brilliant, not called to be successful. It's called to be Faithful, faithful. Certainly everyone wants the, pa the pastor or the preacher or the minister or the missionary. It applies to all. To be a, a great socializer, a door greeter, a visitor, a counselor, a great administrator. And these are all important ministries. 
But the Bible tells us that he is required to be faithful, a faithful steward of the mysteries or the word of God. So I ask you tonight, what is faithfulness? And this is, was the challenge to my life, and I, I hope it comes across as a challenge to your life. If we are called to be found faithful, and we studied about faith in the Sunday school hour, I think it is, had been mentioned, you know, Jesus is coming back. How do you want to be found? So I think it's an important subject tonight as we look in the Word of God. The word faithful occurs some 45 times in the New Testament. Do you think that's an important subject? In the Old Testament, faithful or faithfulness, those two words occur some 47 times. And as you start studying this subject, it does describe God's faithfulness much of the time. But it also refers to the people of God. Because God is faithful. He's calling us to be faithful. We are to model God's character to a world that is too often anything but faithful. So we look at the meeting. The meaning tonight, some definitions from the dictionary, adhering firmly and devotedly as to a person, a cause, or an idea. One of the synonyms it is given is loyal. Loyal. When you think of your character, are you described as a loyal person? When you think of your relationship to Jesus Christ, are you described as being loyal to Christ? Do you ad adhere firmly to Christ? Do you adhere firmly to the word of God? Do you, are you devoted to Jesus Christ and what he's called you to do? Another definition is having or full of faith. And that's what we're studying about in, in Sunday school. You can't separate faith and faithfulness. It's like the root and the fruit. You can't be a faithful Christian, a faithful minister, a faithful steward, a faithful church member if you don't have faith in God. When you go into Strong's definitions, obviously, it gives you a little more uh, broader definitions of the word behind faith and faithfulness, but it does refer to belief and trust. But it also refers to uh, reliability, fidelity. And it is speaking of the faithfulness of God, of the faithfulness of Christ, of the faithfulness of the faithful servants of God in, in the word of God. Same with the Old Testament. But there it has the idea of a firmness, of a, uh, to be established, to be certain. So there must be a firmness a, uh, that leads to a reliability, a trustworthiness to become faithful. We have models in the word of God. The models of faithfulness, I think the greatest model we have is God himself. I want to take you to Lamentations chapter 3. I have a brand new Bible. So my, bi my pages will stick together. So Lament Lamentations chapter 3. I want you to think about what is going on here. Jerusalem 
was destroyed. It became desolate because of the nation's sin. How do you think the prophet Jeremiah felt after preaching faithfully the word of God? And he was treated as a traitor. He preached the truth. So they're looking back at what had happened in Jerusalem, what, what the devastation that came upon them. Yet they're looking forward to the future. And they knew the promises of God. In fact, God promised discipline. God promised judgment upon the nation in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. God also promised there uh, Israel's restoration and future glory. So God is, is war warning them in, in the book of Deuteronomy. And we know we can study the covenant of God. So God was faithful in discharging every aspect of the covenant he made. But Israel was unfaithful. And Israel was punished for her disobedience. But she was not consumed because God's covenant was still in force. Amen? Amen. That's what we see today, amen? amen? Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Just study it. So the same covenant that promised judgment for disobedient is the same covenant that promised restoration for repentance, Deuteronomy chapter 30. So Jeremiah, the prophet, after all that had taken place, could still speak of hope. Can you imagine what he lived through? All that he suffered. Yet he could speak of hope in the midst of the nation's despair because of one thing. Great is thy faithfulness. Look at chapter 3, verse 22. Well, even if you... Look at verse 21, you say, did he really have hope? Yes. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. So in the midst of the despair, Jeremiah could find hope. And one of the things that the conviction he had in his heart, as you read this text, we have failed God, but God cannot fail us. He is faithful. God is faithful. And this is the encouragement for you and me tonight. This is the encouragement as you look to God's immutable character. God's faithfulness. We can become faithful. Amen. Amen. God is faithful. The Bible clearly de declares, as you're seeing in this book, he is faithful to chasten us and to correct us when we need it. Psalm 11975, we won't look at it tonight. More familiar passage, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us when we confess and forsake our sins, Amen. He is faithful to sympathize with us when we have burdens and problems. 
Hebrews chapter 2, as was read this morning, I believe it was chapter 2, chapter 4, he is a faithful and compassionate high priest. Amen? Amen. You never need fear that God is too busy, Amen. that Jesus is too busy to listen to your cry and your burdens. He is there always for you, making intercession always for you. He is faithful to deliver us when we cry out for help in temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He'll be there every time. The question is, do we really want out? Do we want to be delivered from sins, temptation? Do we want to be delivered from Satan's temptation? That's the issue. He's there. There's always a way of escape every time. He's faithful to keep us in this life. And he's faithful to keep us unto life eternal. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Peter tells us we can commit our, our lives and our souls into the hands of the faithful creator. And we know he will do all things well. So we have God's example, God's example of his faithfulness. When you look at the word of God and everywhere you read, God has never failed us. God has never failed a promise. Everything that he's commanded, everything that he's promised in the word of God, he will fulfill every single time. But I like the example of Moses as a model of faithfulness. And this is where it really applies to ministry. When you read about Moses in the New Testament, what does God command about him? Does God talk about all that he accomplished when he talks about Moses. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5. It is talking about Jesus Christ and how he is faithful. But it also brings in the example of Moses in verse number five. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So when you see God commending Moses, it's not talking about all that he accomplished. And you think back tonight. What happened with the first generation that Moses was leading? How successful was he? The whole first generation. Except... Joshua and Caleb failed. You see, when you look back on Moses and you think, wow, it depends on how many numbers we have, right? It depends on, on how many accomplishments we have. No, when God looked upon Moses, he said this, he was faithful. You see, he was faithful to teach the truth, to give out the, the word of God. Clearly, he was God's messenger. He was a prophet of God. And he clearly preached the truth of God. But the decision was not Moses to make. The decision was 
in the hearts of the people. It's just like today. You know, we, we think faithfulness, and I, I, I'm from a missionary standpoint. And you, you look around the world and you see different fields of service and you read different missionary reports and you could think if you're not careful, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Because if I'm being judged by results of what people do, I'm a failure. You see where I'm getting at? Moses, from the standpoint of results, was a failure. From your perspective and my perspective. But from God's perspective, he was a success in life because he was faithful. He was faithful to do what God called him to do. He was faithful to preach what God called him to preach. And God said, this is an example. This is a model for you and me because he was faithful. So let us not judge ministers and stewards like the Corinthians judged him. Let us be spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and not carnal like 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Where there is faithfulness, to discharge one's duties regardless of the results. There is success in the eyes of God. I know this is grading some of you wrongly. I mean, it's, it's abrasive, isn't it? Because this is an American culture, is it? What is success to you? How do you judge a minister? How do you judge a steward? What we need to do is be faithful to the word of God. Faithful to fulfill what God called us to do and leave the results to God. This is what's so hard for us to do. Go back to 1 Corinthians now, chapter number 3. Do you realize that on the mission field, let, let, let me just say something about America. America. I bet you I could go down the street somewhere in America and rent a building and put a sign up there and have people attend my church. And within a couple years, I'd have families moving in that already are Baptists, already are saved, already, and I could say, I'm building a church. There's no such thing on the mission field, folks. There are no members looking for new churches. There are no saved people. They don't even know what Baptists are. That's where you start with people. Look at Paul. I like chapter 3, verse number 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, 
even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. You know, it's all about God's glory. It's not about how much you can do versus how much I can do or how much success you can do or how much success I can do. It's about what God can do. If you're just faithful to fulfill the calling of God upon your life. There's a story of an old Scottish preacher And I think we can learn from this story that there are fields of service that yield very little fruit, humanly speaking. Amen? Not from God's standpoint, but humanly speaking. An elderly Scottish preacher was rebuked by one of his deacons one Sunday morning before the service. Pastor said the deacon. Something must be wrong with your preaching and your work. There's been only one person added to the church in a whole year, and he's just a boy. The preacher listened, his eyes moistening with tears and his thin hand trembling. I feel it all, he replied, but God knows I've tried to do my duty. On that day, the preacher's heart was heavy as he stood before his flock. As he finished the message, he felt, felt a strong inclination to resign. After everyone else had left, that one boy came to him and asked, Do you think if I worked hard for an education, I could become a preacher, perhaps a missionary someday? Again, tears welled up in the preacher's eyes. Ah, this heals the ache, I feel, he said. Robert, I see the divine hand now. May God bless you, my boy. Yes, I think you will become a preacher. Many years later, an aged missionary returned to London from Africa. His name was spoken with reverence. Nobles invited him to their homes. He had added many souls to the church of Jesus Christ, to the kingdom of Christ, reaching even some of Africa's most difficult tribes. His name was Robert Moffat. The same Robert who years before had spoken to that old Scottish preacher that Sunday morning in that old Scottish church. Just think if he wasn't faithful and he gave up. There wouldn't be a Robert Moffat, perhaps a David Livingston, and some of the light that was shed all across Africa and opened many doors that we are stepping through even today. Be faithful. Be faithful to do what God called you to do. You know, we're all called to be faithful in certain areas. What about our prayer time? It's an interesting study. If you go back, um, Genesis chapter 18, study how God worked in Abraham's life to make him an intercessory prayer warrior. Prayer time. How much are we praying? Bible study. Witnessing. How much do we love one another as a church? Not just in word, but in deed. How much do we show that love? How much do we encourage one another spiritually? 
How much do we edify one another spiritually? Are we really concerned that much? How much are we giving to the Lord? And I, I'm thankful for this church. Great sacrificial givers in this church and sacrificial families, and I praise the Lord for that. Showing mercy. And as you go through the word of God, how faithful are we to the duties of every Christian? We all need to be involved in these things. But then I think about those who are gifted, those who God has called, those who have been trained by God. What are you doing with what God gave you? What are you doing with your training? What are you doing with the giftedness that God has given you? Are you faithful to that calling? There's some things I think we need to learn from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me just share two principles from Luke. Luke chapter 16. Verse number 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So I think it's clear what are we doing with the small responsibilities that God has given us in life? And one of those areas is the area of finances. Are we faithful? And I know a lot of guys in Africa who want to be preachers and pastors, but they can't be faithful with the money that God gives them through tithing and offering and being faithful unto God. And I tell them, if you can't be faithful with your money, you can't faithfully give, you can't be a preacher. And then think of all the preachers. I don't know if you know about Africa much, but there's thousands and thousands of false prophets everywhere. And they're there to steal money to fleece the people. That's all they're there for. So that's the mentality. I want to get my own church. It's like a business. They're not servants of the Lord. They're not called of God. They're not stewards of the mysteries of God. They're not faithful ministers called of God. Are we faithful in that which is least so that God can commit to us Amen. true riches? Amen. You know, if we can't take care of our finance, how are we going to take care of souls? True riches. See what I'm saying? God is clear. Look at Luke chapter 12. Verse 48, another principle here. And I think of the preaching that you get in America, the teaching that you get in this church. It is a blessing. It is. But with that blessing comes great responsibility. So what are you doing with that? Look what Jesus says. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Verse 48. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom much men have committed much 
sorry. And to whom man have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Folks, we have a great blessing. We have God has given us great knowledge. God has given us the finances. God has given us the resources to do great things for God. What are we doing? Are we faithful? Because there is coming a day when we will be judged. For everything that God has given us. And I want you to think about that motivating factor. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you notice what we were reading, it says, I want to be found faithful, Paul says. This is my requirement. This is what God wants me to do. I want to be a faithful steward. I want to be a faithful ministry. And he says in verse 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. <clears throat> He's our master, amen? amen? Therefore, verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. Why do you do what you do? What motivates you? What motivates you in the ministry? What motivates you at the job? <laughs> you know, we need to keep our motives pure because one day God is not just going to judge our works. He's going to judge our motives. And I need to have pure motives in the ministry. I need to make sure that I am not in competition with so-and-so missionary or this ministry or this ministry. I need to be faithful to my master. I need to be faithful to my Lord. The only one that will judge me is the Lord. And I need to have thick skin because there'll be a lot of criticism and there'll be a lot of judgment that is false from man because I know one day the Lord will judge me think of Paul if he was doing things with impure motives what would have happened in Philippi would he even have made it to Thessalonica no they were beaten they were imprisoned. They were bloodied. Why do you want to be in the ministry? Our motives need to come from the word of God. We need to constantly check our motives And remain faithful in spite of the results. And this is what I think is the hardest thing in certain fields. Because it's not about the results. It's about, are you doing what God called you to do? Are you faithful to the word of God? Are you faithful as a servant. And that's where I think all of us need to get back focusing on. Are we servants? At heart. We read, I think, Chris, Philippians chapter 2. Jesus 
didn't act like a servant. He was one. He was one. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, let it, we have, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 2, but we have the mind of Christ. And a spiritual mind is one that is a servant. And if I'm a true servant of Christ and I'm following what God called me to do, then I will be faithful unto him. Even if my expectations were not fulfilled, like I thought this is the way it should be in ministry. This is what should be done. If I do this, then this will happen. If it doesn't happen, I need to be faithful. In spite of that. Did you ever read the story about the Chinese bamboo tree? Maybe someone can tell it better than me here. See, the Chinese bamboo tree does absolutely nothing for four years after it's planted. If you didn't know that, you'd be like, let me dig this thing up, throw it out. But something happens during the fifth year. It suddenly shoots up 80 to 90 feet in a period of six weeks. Now, we might ask the question, does the bamboo tree grow in six weeks or in five years? Now, remember this. If it didn't have the foundation and the roots down, then that 80 or 90 feet would not be supported. This is what God is doing in your life. You may not see the fruit, but he is building a foundation in your life and in your ministry upon which you will become faithful. Amen. Because of the trials and because of suffering and because of seeking God and praying and sacrificing and seeing no results. He's working on you to be faithful and then that fruit will come. You know what? It may not come in this life, but it will come. It will come. There was a missionary back in the 1800s, late 1800s to 1900s to Muslim nations, Samuel Zwemer. There was a time in 1904 that temperatures were above 107 degrees and both of his daughters died within a few days apart of each other. 50 years later, as he looks back upon this, he wrote, the sheer, sheer joy of it all comes back. Gladly would I do it all over again. He was a missionary to Bahrain, different locations in Arabia, 1891 to 1905, a member of the Arabian Mission, 1890-1913, served in Egypt from 1913 to 1929. He traveled widely through Asia Minor, came back to America, became a professor of missions, professor of history of the religion, of religion at the Princeton uh, Theological University Seminary at that time, 1937. He founded and edited the publication, The Muslim World, for 35 years. Ruth Tucker wrote of this man uh, about his converts. Probably less than a dozen converts during his nearly 40 years of service. Yet, his greatest contribution to missions was that of stirring Christians 
to the need of evangelism among Muslims. His greatest contribution was encouraging others to pray, to go. And I'm sure there's fruit even today of this man's life and this man's faithfulness. What I'm saying is you may not see it with your eyes. And if you're just in it for what you see and how great of name you're making, you know, in Africa, the great preachers, the powerful preachers have a bumper sticker with their name and their face on there. And that's, you know, they're famous. They're powerful. See, being faithful in our lives is often like the bamboo tree. Sometimes we continue to expend a great deal of effort and see few results. Nothing appears to be happening. But the promise of Scripture, just like the covenant that God gave to Israel, the promises of Scripture is that if we continue to be faithful to the Lord, we will receive our reward. It will be worth it all. Amen. And I think the greatest thing, and this should be a reality in your mind's eye, you should keep this before you. Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Amen. Amen. I pray that God makes us faithful to the end unto death. Let us be faithful. Let's pray. Will you stand with me tonight? What is success for you? Why are you in the ministry? What are your expectations? Do you judge carnally? Ministers, stewards, ministries. How do you view yourself if you're a minister? Are you a galley slave in your own opinion? Father, help us tonight. Father, help us to be faithful servants. Help us to be faithful stewards. Father, help us in spite of the results at times in our lives, in our ministries. At those times, Lord, when we don't see things happening, help us to remember these scriptures, to remember this message and the promises that we might be encouraged and have hope, knowing that you will come back and your reward is with you. You're bringing our rewards in that day. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts tonight. Have your will and way in each and every one of us, Lord, and help us to be surrendered unto you, to be obedient to the calling that you put upon our lives, to be faithful to that duty, that calling every day. knowing that one day you're coming back to judge us. Father, help us to be found so doing, to be found faithful. Father, I think in my own life, it says, will the Lord find faith on the earth? Father, help, help us increase our faith. Help us to grow. 
We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Brother Chris.